crazy about your smile, I'm crazy about you all. Shiver and I shake when I hear your baby toe. Fool for your love and babe, give me all your love to me. Welcome to another installment of Monday q and I hope you've all had a fantastic weekend. I sound pretty stuffed up today, but I'm actually feeling about a thousand times better than I did for most of last week. There is nothing like being sick to make you appreciate what it feels like to be healthy again. So I'm just here breathing some fresh air. I want to get to your questions. I want to say thank you to everybody who submitted a question for this week's Q&A and a massive thank you to everybody who continues to support the channel by subscribing, watching the videos, telling your mates about it. And in particular, I want to give a shout out to my amazing patrons over at Patreon that is linked in the video description. If you want to check that out and keep the lights on in here and keep my cats fed, got plenty of questions to get through today. I will just say if there's something you would like me to talk about on next week's video, you've got a specific question, simply drop it in the comment section below. Let's go. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke about my favorite Ozzy Osbourne guitar players. On the topic of Gus G, I was asked about the band Dream Evil and Dream Evil are a band I haven't listened to for a long time. So I went back and listened to some Dream Evil and I kind of still like it. I was skeptical that I would still enjoy it in the same way that I did when I first discovered this band that was a new band kind of doing classic heavy metal stuff. And I do remember the song, The Book of Heavy Metal being one of those unashamed metal anthems. It's kind of up there with Metal Is Forever by Primal Fear, another great kind of more modern, you know, people call them a power metal band to me. They're just a melodic heavy band. Uh, but yeah, that album's really, really good. I actually went and watched they did a live DVD. There's some live stuff up on YouTube that sounds amazing. And the singer is nailing everything on there. So sounds really good, like big chunky tones on there. Gus is obviously an incredible guitar player. So the lead stuff is brilliant, but really, really impressed with the vocals there. So if you've never gone and checked out some older Dream Evil, go and do yourself a favor. If you're more into the kind of melodic power metal thing, Gus's other band Firewind are great as well. And uh, totally unrelated, but another band I really enjoy from that particular era who are still going, Primal Fear, Ralph Sheepers is kind of like the reincarnation of Halford and they have some amazing dual guitar harmony lines in there. So uh, yeah, some power metal to get into your ears this week. Check it out. What styles of guitar playing would I like to explore in the future? You're probably pretty familiar with what I do on the channel. I just refer to it as, you know, rock adjacent. So lots of rock, lots of metal, prog, blues. I like a lot of atmospheric stuff. I like a lot of heavier modern metal stuff but you could argue that it's kind of all based on a kind of rock guitar foundation. There's plenty of styles outside of that. And while I don't listen to a lot of jazz, I do like early seventies fusion stuff like Mahavishnu Orchestra, Return to Forever, you know, the early Aldemiola stuff I think is amazing. I still love listening to that stuff. So that's something that I should probably spend some more time actually exploring and learning because I spent a lot of time in my early 20s doing just that and even featuring some of it on the channel because it's great stuff. Uh, I'm not a massive traditional jazz guy, as you can probably guess. Nothing against the style. It's just something that I've never really massively got into kind of like country as well. I think that would be one style of music that I think I would have a deeper appreciation of if I actually went and learnt some of this kind of classic hot country stuff. I watch guys like Clifton Wright and Luke Gallagher play that stuff and they absolutely blow my mind. And, you know, while it's not like rock adjacent, it's maybe like one more step away from it. There's a lot of crossover there. And then you have all the modern great players who do that thing, you know, the kind of post Brent Mason era. And you got guys like Dan Huff. And if you've heard of players like Andy Wood, Andy can do the rock and metal thing and the bluegrass thing and like cross picking acoustic stuff and mandolin and country stuff. So, He's someone I really admire from just an overall musicality perspective. So it would probably be something in that direction. Uh, bluegrass is totally fascinating to me as well. I really, really love the kind of newer stuff that's coming out, guys like Billy Strings and Molly Tuttle, who is just phenomenal. So something in that direction. And I'm also really into non-Western musical styles of 
playing music, you know, whether it is South Indian music or whether it is music from the Middle East. Uh, one of my favorite guitar players at the moment is a guy called Angel Demerev. If you haven't heard Angel's playing, is basically using an electric guitar to sound like an oud and there's so much microtonality happening in there. And that's someone I would just love to sit down for a few hours with and get shown the basics of his incredible style. So uh, yeah, there's actually quite a lot. That's one thing that's amazing about guitar is that you can have the styles that you're really comfortable with, but it gives you this window into so many other musical cultures. It's kind of magic like that. Speaking of musical cultures though, one of the primary musical cultures in my life is the band Whitesnake. And they have had so many lineups and so many great musicians come through that band. So much like I've been doing over the last couple of weeks, I'm gonna talk about my favorite Whitesnake guitar players. And if you've followed my channel for any amount of time, you know, the goat is John Sykes. So let's just, uh, let's just put John up at number one. 1987 is my favorite Whitesnake album. It's the album that introduced me not only to Whitesnake, but I guess that high intensity, melodic hard rock style that they did so well on that album. Also, because of that album, I got into a bunch of the older Whitesnake stuff, so the Moody and Marsden era, and I'm a massive, massive fan of Bernie Marsden's player. Bernie is a phenomenally gifted rock and blues guitar player, just, just tasty. Like, when you want to listen to what an electric guitar sounds like in a rock context, just go and put on some old Whitesnake, and they've got the groove, they've got the swagger, uh, both Bernie and Mickey Moody are just incredibly tasteful players, and I like that they're sort of traditionalists when it comes to blues, but they've got all that extra stuff in there. Like there's a lot of minor scale phrasing in there. I mean, just the solo in Full Fear Loving or the original version of Crying in the Rain is such a great example of that. So for me, when it comes to Whitesnake, they're the players that I think of immediately. And I also remember when it came out 2004, 2005, buying that in the still of the night live DVD. And because I knew Red Beach, who's one of my favorite guitar players, was in Whitesnake. And I checked it out and I was like, oh my God, that guy with the blonde hair and the six pack abs and the Les Paul around his toes, who's amazing. What was his name again? Doug Aldrich, he's on this. And watching that DVD, I watched it so much. Doug is just incredible on that. So I'm gonna put Doug up there as well. Obviously Joel Hoekstra is now doing that gig and Joel is like on another planet. So, so phenomenally gifted. When I saw Whitesnake in 2015, which was actually on the same day that I got married in Vegas, uh, obviously Joel was doing that gig and that was just, that was a bucket list thing right there to see Whitesnake. And uh, yeah, technically they played at my wedding reception. So that's a nice little tie in right there. I don't really love Steve Vai and Whitesnake. I'm gonna come out and say it. Slip of the Tongue has a few great tracks on it. Judgment Day is one of my favorite Whitesnake songs, but I kind of like the live version they did with Doug and Reb a little bit more. To me, the Vi and Whitesnake thing sounds more like Vi than it sounds like Whitesnake. To me, the 90s albums that David did under the Whitesnake banner, even though they were kind of solo albums with various people playing on them, I know Earl Slick played on one of them. That's more Whitesnake to me. And then of course, you know, the Vi thing is also the Adrian Vandenberg thing. And I know people absolutely worship Adrian. I kind of like Adrian's playing and Adrian's signature PV is one of the coolest guitars from that era, but yeah, it just doesn't do a lot for me. That's all, I much prefer the kind of over the top swagger someone like John or Doug Aldrich has, or the more kind of grounded rootsy thing of the Mickey Moody. Bernie Marsden era as well. Uh, who else was in Whitesnake? Uh, Mel Galley, who did the Phenomena albums. Did Mel do the Phenomena albums or was that Tom Galley? Anyway, that Phenomena, the first album is very, very good. Highly recommend you go check it out. They also have a song called Still the Night, not to be confused with Still of the Night. And uh, I wrote a long list here because uh, there was a bunch of people who were in Whitesnake very briefly in the 90s, like Warren Demartini, another one of my favorite guitar players. Uh, there's the whole Coverdale Page thing as well, which is one of the best one-off albums from the 90s. If you haven't heard the Coverdale Page album, go and do it. It's some of David's best work and it's some of Jimmy's best work, in my opinion, as well. Uh, who else was in this band? Like I said, Earl Slick played on one of David's solo albums as well. Dan Huff played some stuff in a session setting as well. Uh, you've got Reb Beach, of course. Reb's amazing and Reb can sing. He kind of holds that band 
together because those big backing vocals sounded so amazing live. Pretty sure Steve Farris from Mr. Mister was in Whitesnake for a hot minute, much like Vivian Campbell. And you know, like I said earlier, the Vice stuff, Steve wasn't really in Whitesnake for that long. I much prefer Steve's work with David Lee Roth. There's just a great chemistry that you can hear on there. It's kind of David's over the top showmanship and Steve's over the top showmanship coming together and really, really gelling. So I'm not saying I don't like Steve Vai. I adore Steve Vai. I just love Steve Vai so much more on the DLR albums that he did. Uh, it just kind of seemed like, you know, a, a square peg in a round hole for the white snake thing to me. But uh, what do I know about anything? Let me know your favorite lineup of white snake and your favorite white snake album and guitar player let's all celebrate some White Snake because they're a great band. Let's talk about some gear related things on here. I was asked about playing in standard tuning drop D or drop C. You hear a lot more standard tuning on the channel now that I've got my DGT. When I play it here, I normally have it in standard tuning. It's become my go-to guitar. My main PRS SC245, the black one that you can see hanging up there, lives permanently in drop C. That is still the number one ragdoll guitar. I have been doing a lot more ragdoll stuff with the DGT. So we have a gig coming up this weekend. I'm going to take the DGT out in drop C. I just use the same set of Alexa 10 to 52 nano web strings that I basically use on all my guitars. Sound great in standard tuning. They work great in drop C as well. And if you've never played around with drop tunings, just start with drop D. You can start with the one finger power chord thing and then do ninths and then do the King's X thing where you have low power chords with droning high notes. I would just say go and listen to some King's X if you kind of want to get a hang on drop D, get out of the silent planet or Gretchen goes to Nebraska and learn some of those songs. Drop C sharp for the Alice in Chains thing as well. Go and learn some Alice in Chains songs and you'll get a great idea of how you can use drop D in a kind of rock context where it's actually not that different to playing in standard. What happened to the JP7? Nothing happened to the JP7. It is still here. I've been doing lots and lots of gigs with this guitar because it has a piezo pickup or a piezo pickup. I still don't know how to say that properly, uh, but for a lot of acoustic duo gigs where you know, you're playing through a single PA speaker and you turn down real low anyway, this guitar has been an absolute godsend because I can hook it up to use the under saddle pickup and the electric pickup in there, you know, loop some chords with the acoustic sound, play some leads over it. So. It's pretty awesome. I've got it in drop A at the moment. I did a video uh, last weekend about the Mudkiller plugin where I played it a bunch and she's got a very particular sound about it. You know, these pickups are voiced to be really mid heavy and this kind of pair up really nicely with the Mark series amp. We should hear it. <laughs> longer delay trails on your racks effects when you're changing from say your lead scene to your rhythm scene. A couple of different ways you could do it. Probably the easiest one would be to set up your delay with slightly more feedback than usual, but engage the ducker effect and then turn the overall level up so that when you're playing and the duck is kicked in, it kind of brings your delay down to your normal level where you've got it at the moment. And then when you turn it off, then the trails will come up in volume and you'll hear more repeats on there. So that would be the easiest way to do that. You could also do other things like attaching ADSRs or pitch followers or envelope followers to various parameters in there. But I think the ducking approach is kind of prime and really designed for that. Using a boost with a Mark series amp, generally, I don't think they need them. That's one reason why I really like those amps. But if I am gonna run some dirt into a Mark series amp, especially on my Mark IV, the rhythm channel can do some real kind of martially style things on there. So hitting it with a tube screamer or an SD1 can just further enhance that modded martial nature of that channel. Furthermore, one thing I really like with the Mark series amp is setting it up to be super tight and then putting something like a swollen pickle in front of it and tuning down and getting kind of doom soul tones out of it because that like pre-gain EQ on there can kind of tame some of the harshness of the fuzz. And then you've got the other gain stages in there. So yeah, the Mark series are kind of really underrated platforms for fuzz pedals, in my opinion. 
or depending on the model that you have, you can use them as a clean pedal platform or use the crunch channel on a modern Mark series amp to do pseudo Marshall style things. You should try it out. That is it for this week's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got a question for next week, put it in the comment section below. If you want to support me on Patreon or you want to buy some of the music that I make with my band Ragdoll, that is linked in the video description. Uh, for people wondering as well, you can see a very sleepy big gray cat behind me. And it sounds like there's a tinkering bell coming in here. I was right. She's not happy about being held though. So uh, let's just put her on the table. Uh, this is Nagini and that's Lupin. For anyone who was asking about the cats, uh, they are here being absolute terrors, which is exactly the way I like it. Have a great week. I'll see you next time. Wow! Yeah.